just going to go ahead and get started. All right. So, uh, what a great uh, two and a half days, a very diverse set of talks and speakers. Uh, we're really privileged to have um, three of the four Grand Challenge uh, lecturers to, to join us uh, for the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour to kind of do a wrap up of the two and a half days. And I really want to uh, thank Dr. Larry Smar, Dr. Vipin Kumar, and Dr. Quark Smith um, for participating. Dr. Michael Warner is currently uh, in Europe, so he couldn't join us this last day. Um, so really, we wanted this, this panel to be opened up to you all as much as possible to allow you all to, to really pick the brains of, of these three uh, very distinguished uh, computer scientists in, in their uh, own disciplines and fields. Uh, and I'll, I have a couple prepared questions, uh, and I'll start off with one. Um, but then I, I would like to just open it up to you all to, to have that engagement. And so uh, given the motivation of this uh, workshop was to try to bring together the different areas of technology and machine learning and, and big data and, and earth sciences, you know, there's many different disciplines and, and background knowledge that uh, we all have. And so, you know, what do you think is the biggest progress that has been made in big data and the earth sciences? And are there lessons um, that we can learn from this progress? progress to apply to other problems in this area. And maybe we'll just uh, start off and, and have you each um, uh, say a little uh, something about that. Uh, well, I think, you know, I've been involved with big data in the earth sciences for decades, um, from when they first started the earth observation program, actually. Um, I mean, there's good news and bad news. I guess I, if I look at it on a multi-decadal basis, um, there's more standardization of data. You can find it easier than you used to be able to. Um, the bad news is there's still not a national big data cyber infrastructure that would allow for very quick pulling together of disparate data sets uh, you know, I was the head of the uh, IT advisory group for all of NASA and worked with all the centers. Um, there's still a big bottleneck in um, uh, the centers and, and you know, uh, having online access to a lot of the data sets because as you get more, I mean, more where you're trying to do discovery science, you need to be able to get at stuff sort of the way you do with the web. It's just there, you know, right now. <laughs> and uh, that's all doable, but it takes multi-federal agency planning. And that, in my opinion, I've seen it happen once or twice in 30 years. It's, it's a huge deal to try to get NASA, DOE, NSF, NIH to work together uh, on as And as we get into, for instance, climate change, and human health, which is going to be a gigantic problem, um, I think all four of those agencies will be involved. Well, I, I think just sort of um, the range of challenges, and of course, Larry has uh, pointed out some of them, and, and from the perspective of people working in computer science uh, who like to be uh, collaborating with people from different disciplines, and earth sciences is a very broad discipline. And the geosciences, earth sciences, is, 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 is a very vast community. Uh, and as, as, as you heard this morning's talk, you know, um, in, in computer science, we are very used to developing algorithms focused on certain uh, uh, objectives. Uh, and, and, and these algorithms do bring in billions of dollars to, uh, to profit to industry in, in a certain way. Uh, uh, and, and, and but taking those algorithms and applying them and make them effective for uh, these range of disciplines is much more challenging. And, and the the tendency that well I have this algorithm you you go use it is is a sort of uh, the, the tradition doesn't really work as well because you really have to be able to understand a little bit more about the problem otherwise you end up. Uh, Realizing that you're building a function that gives that's going to give you a completely un, um, uh, conventional results, like the, the, the somebody the females becoming faster than males, or, or the speed becoming negative, uh, 
uh, going back, going into 100 years. So, so basically, you have to bring in uh, somehow the knowledge of the physical domain the, uh, that, that, that is sort of traditionally used into the algorithms. And that's, and that's not easy to do unless you're, you're working together. And then and we have to, that's a, that's a big challenge. And how do we um, make that possible? And, and, uh, and given the fact that the, the people who are doing PhD in computer science are busy uh, with their own uh, coursework and, 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 and research work. How do they take time away uh, to learn about a different discipline? It's very, very tough. So how do you bring these different people, sort of people together? Uh, how do you create reward structure for them? Uh, that, that's a huge challenge. So I guess, Scott, your question was about successes in uh, big data in, uh, you know, that we perceive. Um, from my perspective, you know, the, the, the gathering and access to data, I'm a little more optimistic than Larry, perhaps, because I remember when I was back at JPL trying to get data sets. And you have to remember, there was no internet uh, in 1990. <laughs> and so if you wanted a data set from somebody on the East Coast, you'd send them a letter, and they would send you back a floppy disk or a tape. And, and so things have really changed in a very positive way. That, you know, the, 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 the uh, global coverage with uh, remote sensing and uh, ground-based uh, measurements is and the availability of that data is, is I, th I think, a forcing function that's, that's great that I've seen change. However, um, you know, one, one thing that I'd like to add about where we really need improvement is metadata. Um, I constantly face this with projects where we're trying to pull together different data sets, and we spend so much time trying to figure out um, what exactly was, was measured, what's missing, you know, what are these units, um, and that, you know, NASA spends a lot of money gathering data, but then seems to spend far less uh, documenting it properly. So not just the measurements, the data, but the, the metadata is, 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 is extremely important for uh, longevity and reuse of the data. And I, I feel like people don't pay. It's not a very exciting topic. <laughs> you know, you start talking about metadata, and people start leaving the room. And, uh, <laughs> but it's very important. And uh, yeah. Great. OK, and then um, another question is, we kind of, I know Vipin and, and Larry, you both kind of alluded to this, but collaborating across disciplines, you know, what would be your number one priority to try to alleviate these challenges of the multidisciplinary, or at least a lot of these algorithms now being applied in all sorts of disciplines with people who have some or very little training on what the algorithms are actually doing? I mean, how... How can you um, collaborate now that all these technologies and approaches are kind of converging and the access to the data is changing and more and more students are exposed to the mass media hype of, uh, maybe not hype, but at least the use of deep learning in, in lots of applications. So um, what, what, what would you say would be the number one priority in trying to alleviate that challenge? Well, I've spent 30 years at NCSA and College 2 building institutions that bring together uh, what Donna Cox used to call renaissance teams. So teams that involve disciplines from multiple widely separated disciplines and, and coming in as equals and having to learn enough about each other's area that they can be productive. Uh, that's still pretty rare and I would say that the biggest academic um, problem is that the reward structure for advancement in the university system is still completely focused on single investigator, single paper in a good journal kind of things. And, and it's, it's, it's slowly, slowly, and it's very dependent on which campus you're on, uh, you're beginning to get, okay, well, maybe we'll give you some credit if you do something cross-disciplinary, but we gotta figure out exactly what you did out of the end authors, right? Um, so until that changes, so this is just the triumph of reductionism, which we've spent 100, 200 years doing in science. Um, I mean, there's a reason you, that's the way the system is. But as we get, as this pendulum swings back towards synthesis of what we've learned through reductionism, uh, which is what this century is largely about, uh, then uh, hopefully we'll see the reward structure change and then if the you know people tend to follow incentive <laughs> like any other creature um, and uh, and so if the incentives are begin to be uh, uh, pointed toward collaboration then I think you'll see a lot more people do it because it's a lot of fun uh, to get a little bit out of your your you know 
neural specialty and, and actually solve a real problem. And absolutely right. The reward, reward structure is actually the, the one of the major uh, barriers to it. And, and again, it sort of exists at many, many levels. Uh, in universities, it exists in the form of uh, tenure promotions. Um, uh, people trying to figure out what's, uh, what you did for, for your own discipline, which of course is important, but then people who work at the boundary, uh, discipline boundaries, uh, have much harder time dis dis uh, uh, justifying uh, their value to one, of the, one community or the other. And the other aspect of this shows up in uh, publications and such. So when a, a student in computer science is working on the development of algorithms with some uh, benchmark data sets, it's much easier for them to prepare a publication in a matter of months. Because if you're trying to solve um, a real problem, uh, it's a much harder and much longer and much more involved process. And oftentimes, the, uh, the publication um, culture in different disciplines is very different. In computer science, people would be able to turn on maybe one or two or three papers in a year in multiple cycles uh, over the year. But in art sciences, oftentimes you would give conference talks for many, many years before which you get no credit, but journal articles can go through a very stringent peer review process for multiple years before they get published. And they don't make any sense to anybody in computer science when they're looking at the resume. So it's, uh, it becomes very challenging uh, to, um, for the students. In, 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 so you have, to, you have to be really committed to work in this area. Uh, to be able to make uh, to to sort of join this frontier of computer science, machine learning, and art sciences, and and I think that is something that one needs to be able to do to to improve that atmosphere. And I think workshops like these um, are sort of a, a step in that direction. So I I certainly agree with the previous speakers. In fact, Scott, I think this is going to be a very boring panel because we keep agreeing with each other. <laughs> uh, but having said that, I'm going to. Uh, go one step further back in the pipeline of you know, research and scientific advances to education. I, I think we kind of need to take a hammer to the current, um, let's think of the undergraduate education and graduate education in terms of courses. So I see this uh, EC Urban, I'm sure it's replicated other places. Um, student wants to learn about Bayesian statistics or computational statistics. There is like eight prerequisites they need to have to take that class. So an earth science student can't just pop in and take it without it. And some of them do, do a master's in statistics. And that's really unfortunate. Um, similarly, in computer science, to take a machine learning class or a database class, you need to have a certain uh, computational background. So in some of the other disciplines, they're certainly offering classes, you know, quick intros. But I think we're, we're a little too siloed. And it really becomes clear in these, uh, you know, uh, if, you, if you want to call it data science areas, that uh, we're educating people in sort of traditional ways and universities are very slow to change. We're starting to think about new degree programs, more interdisciplinary stuff, uh, but we're, 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 we're you know, way behind what's actually happening out there in practice. So right now, people get their de primary degrees in whatever area it is, and you spend the next five or 10 years you know, figuring out all the other stuff that you really need to know to, to do useful things, and, and that's inefficient. Um, most of the people in this room can probably identify with this in the sense that they got their degree and then they've spent the rest of their career figuring out all the other bits and pieces. Why not think about some of this right from the get-go when you have an 18-year-old coming into a uh, university? And they can't be an expert, obviously, in everything, but I think we can uh, be a little bit more flexible in, in our teaching. And, uh, so. but I, want, I want to be just a little bit more positive. Um, I totally agree with uh, everything that they said, and particularly what Quirk just said. Um, but you know, if you actually look, there's now a data science initiative at Irvine, and there's a big new data science uh, donor provided initiative uh, here at UC San Diego. Um, and so I think there's a real opportunity to, in an ad hoc fashion, just as we have been here for Cal IT2 on both the Irvine and San Diego campus for 17 years, is we can put together small teams. Um, you know, I'm just talking with Bruce Cornell down at, at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Well, he's got some really cool ideas about how uh, machine learning could be used in some of his pretty sophisticated uh, earth sciences uh, simulations. And we can probably put together a small team to get that going. Uh, and, and, and so I think, you know, that's not going to reform the whole field, but, but I think there, opportunistically we have chances now to to uh, to do this, or what Scott, for instance, uh, you know, Scott has been a tremendous um, help 
uh, to find, because he was out of both the Irvine group, Sorus Jerusia and, and precipitation, and then here with Marty Ralph uh, in extreme uh, weather and uh, weather, water weather issues um, at San Diego. And so he's been able to pull together an actual two campus collaboration. Um, and, uh, and, and these glue people are the thing that make things happen. Um, it actually is not just like you have a, people that don't know anything about each other, but you get people that get in these overlaps and then you make some progress. So I'm, I'm a great believer in if you can take a step, take it. Just a quick follow-up on that. At UCSD and UCI have data science things going on, a lot more funding here at uh, UCSD. Uh, Berkeley actually is doing some very interesting things uh, coming out of statistics and computer science. They have freshman classes in data science which are then connectors to mm -hmm. various disciplines. Um, so they institutionally they're still setting up a sort of new organization there, but uh, they've, they've thought a lot about education and some of this work is Well, Berkeley online. just set up a vice chancellor yes. uh, for data sciences. But they've been doing it, uh, they've had these freshman courses and, and some top-notch people involved in the design and, and really thinking of how do you teach people to think about data in a statistical and computational fashion applied to particular domains. So there's some very nice ideas there too. All right, great, thank you. And, and certainly the development of the, the progress in data science. I mean, you see data science programs sprouting up all over the country. Uh, and many institutions are thinking about even offering a bachelor's degree in, in data science, going for master's as well. Uh, and, and of course, that makes it somewhat easier uh, uh, to create an ecosystem where the student from other discipline could learn more about things like machine learning, statistics, systems, oriented issues, uh, and that's very, very important. But what I see uh, something very hard to be able to address is, is if, if, you are, if you're rooted in computer science and if you want to work at the interface of machine learning and our sciences, what kind of knowledge would you be able to acquire in, in this vast set of disciplines that span art sciences uh, in a limited amount of time, even in a, if, in if you're doing oceanography, if you're doing space science, if you're doing atmospheric science, you specialize in one of those areas and spend six years. So if it's, it's much harder uh, for us to expect computer scientists to have a broader um, understanding of these wide disciplines, and which is where uh, if we have to have cutting edge research at this intersection, we have to have teams. We have to be able to in incentivize them. We have to be able to create ecosystem and people who work on, on those teams and inter interface get rewarded. And we have to have venues, journals, conferences where that that kind of work would be appreciated. And it's it's a, it's very much a work in progress. You know, and Larry, you have been working in it for many decades. I've been sort of uh, have a steep about 17 years in this area. And again, it's it's still uh, we're still at a very early stage, and we need to do a lot more. Great, thank you. So now let's turn to, to you all in the audience. Uh, do we have some questions for the, the panelists? One in the back, Ross. Yeah. Yeah, m my answer is we need people who are trained at the interface rather than you know both discipline. We just don't have enough people who are comfortable with both statistics and computer science. Obviously, they can't know both fields totally, but we do need people who are fluent uh, in sort of, if you want to call it computational statistics, data science. Industry, there's a huge demand for people like this, uh, but also in the sciences. So I think on the education side, we need to think more of training people who are, you know, have, have skills from both camps. I would say Porek's talk this morning was a fantastic motivation uh, to bridge that gap. It would be hard to say anything more. All right. Any questions? David.
I, I think it's a great development. Uh, I mean, as you said, IBM is for the billion dollar acquisition. There was another billion dollar acquisition was on Climate Corp. And there are a whole bunch of startups that are sort of rising up, uh, which are uh, poised to take data from all of these public and non-public satellites and put them into commercial uses. There are a vast number of them in the Bay Area and, and elsewhere around the world. And I think that hopefully would sort of create, would contribute to the reward structure, like, like the, uh, the advertisement, the online advertisement placement has created for machine learning in the last uh, uh, 10 years or so. Uh, and that definitely would be, um, would be a positive infusion uh, of a reward structure. But I don't think we can rely just upon that because we have to sort of, it, it has to be synergistic feed, right? You know, we have to, do, we have to work both in the academic angle and then the, and then the industry angle simultaneously. I mean, if you, if you draw an analogy with the big military investment in satellite technology, you know, that obviously had some nice byproducts and follow on for science. Um, so we could hope that with the commercialization of some of the remote sensing stuff that we would see similar byproducts. But it's not necessarily going to happen automatically. You have to keep in mind companies have shareholders and stock prices and quarterly reports. They're very short term focused and, uh, you know, very different to scientists in the sense that when they speak or publish a paper, they're, they're trying to get a message across. And so we just have to, I, I'd be careful. About, <laughs> I'd be also a little worried if they were to take all the smart people in the area and suck them up into companies. Uh, that means less people working in NCAR and JPL and places like that. So. Yeah, I'd like to underline that. I mean, we, we have this all the time. Um, in fact, I, my, one of my main machine learning um, postdocs here is uh, that I'm finally, after several years, have gotten um, working on the microbiome. Uh, it's a different area, but actually very similar to uh, Earth Sciences ecological dynamics, um, is uh, taking a job in the private sector now. So I have to start all over again. And there are not that many people, uh, actually, in the university that can do this. On the other hand, uh, at CalIT2, we've had over 400 companies work with us on projects with academics. And so whenever we put together one of these cross-disciplinary teams, we look for opportunities to bring in uh, either people from the sort of supply side, the vendor side of software or hardware, that sort of thing, or from the, uh, the sort of consumption side, like you know the actual use on a product area like biotech or earth sciences or something like that. But I'd like to make another comment. This country is really at a crossroads. And I think if you're not taking a global viewpoint, um, then you're going to be part of a sinking ship. Um, with the federal government in the contrans, the people that it's in control of at the moment, um, the outlook for science funding is at best flat to not declining too much and possibly catastrophic. Uh, collapse in, in, in certain areas. When you have the president of the newly elected president of France in English, which is sort of a sin in France, um, putting a speech out on the web inviting earth sciences and climate scientists to leave the United States and come to France as one of the first things he did as a new president of France. You, if that doesn't wake you up, you know, that this country is, is headed in a very different direction than you may have thought it was going. So I think we have, Cal IQ was sort of born global, everything we've done all these years. We have, in this room, we have, I don't know how many times a year, major international collaborations coming, people coming from all over the world working together with us. And I think if you don't take that larger view, the United States just isn't going to be able to be a leader uh, for some time. Uh, perhaps decades, uh, in the way that we were since World War II. Now, that's not necessarily bad in the sense that um, the EU, China, and many of the other players are, are coming of age and are going to make a lot of investments that we're not. Um, but I think that's something that we tend in the United States to be a little bit inward looking sometimes as to if it's going to get done, we're going to be the ones to do it. And I just think that's um, 20th century thinking. So, and, and it's interesting. I like to think of myself as still young, but um, 
I, I, I've seen this pendulum go back and forth when it comes to not just funding, but also kind of interest in different disciplines, uh, even though it hasn't gone back and forth near as much uh, for me as others in this room. Um, but obviously you have to adapt to kind of which way it's swinging. And given the fact that federal funding may be changing uh, dramatically, you know, business, uh, the comment from uh, David about interest from the business sector in the earth sciences and big data may help drive uh, a lot of that research investment. Just what are your thoughts on uh, industry beginning to now possibly play a larger role in investing in, in university uh, research? Well, one of the things that I'm working with, um, just advising a little bit, um, you know, if you look at Google and its planetary computer, um, it can do amazing things, but high performance computing is not one of them. Uh, tightly coupled uh, network uh, specialized processors, um, you know, say like you see at Oak Ridge or San Diego Supercomputer Center or NCSA. Now they could, if there was a business <laughs> case, and that is if there were demand for those services. So one of the things that I would uh, think might help this little thing along of, of seeing if we could get the private sector working more on some of the problems that we work on would be to find a way to um, um, interest the Google, Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, and so forth to um, get involved in some serious earth science problems like climate. Um, and it's not out of the question. Uh, they have done it, and then they've pulled back away from it. I don't know if you remember, but Google at one point started saying, we're going to host all these very large scientific data sets, and then they decided there wasn't uh, money in it uh, at the moment, so they get, took out of that. They, they were, in, um, for instance, uh, very involved in, in, in involved in people generating data about their bodies and, and taking care of that, and then they got out of that business. So if there was a way that we could get them more engaged with us, and that would provide also more uh, opportunities than, you know, if, if some of the worst things happen that, you know, have been proposed, um, then uh, in the federal government, then, then you know, that, that could be a way forward. And frankly, you know, and the, think about this week's developments or, uh, with the Paris Accord, um, what we're seeing is the CEOs of almost all the large companies, including ExxonMobil, mm -hmm. are saying, well, we don't care what the President of the United States says. We are fully committed to the Paris Accord, as are many of the governors and, and certainly almost all the city uh, leaders worldwide. So, um, so that actually could be a forcing function historically to say to the CEOs, well, if that's what you think, and that includes a lot of the, most of the Silicon Valley uh, mega companies, uh, Apple, Microsoft, Google, et cetera, um, then maybe you ought to get, roll up your sleeves and get serious about doing something about climate change. And, and so I don't think that's out of the question. Just one, one comment there. <coughs> sure. I, I think companies are great to work with for applied R&D, especially in air engineering, computer science, that bridge right. from getting something to really work. But I would worry about basic research and basic science. Uh, it's just not in their interest they, for their shareholders. They can't be, you know, so that's what NSF is for. And so I don't think they can, I think we need, you know, we need to be realistic about where companies can help, but th th it's the, but the if basic you, research that it, I You know, about. the question is, is, is climate, change over this century basic research anymore? Or is it critical to every aspect of human society and economy, every business? They had the CEO or I guess the vice president from Mars, right? Mars that makes like candy bars, <laughs> chocolate, <laughs> pet food. Uh, on NPR yesterday, and um, he said, "You know, we've we've 
turned the corner. I mean, it's not a question for us. We're going entirely to sustainable energy because that's economically what's going to happen. We're going to need this, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. So if, who is it that is going to provide the global and then regional downscale truth function for the most likely probability of change all over the world so that companies have the data they need to make decisions globally, they're all global companies, um, on how to adapt to climate change. For that's what the next century is about. And so it seems to me that although basic research can, can partner with that in terms of improving things at the basis, it, it's not exactly university work or even necessarily national lab work to, um, to hold the global planet model that uh, everybody from insurance companies to you know, places that have <coughs> products, have agri I mean, just think of agriculture, just think of everywhere in the world now. Things are being grown and shipped and all this, all this is gonna get messed up. Uh, Yesterday, uh, was a talk from Janine Jones, who um, is at the Department of Water Resources, was talking about the investments and the you know, catastrophic damages caused by drought on crops. And uh, it was in the billions range. And she was mentioning that s you know, seasonal to subseasonal forecasts right, uh, are you know, only getting you know, 10 to 20 million dollars of investment into figuring it out. But if we could you know, be able to predict uh, just uh, a month or two out in advance, we could potentially prepare our society for these shifts in climate, which would inevitably uh, lower that, uh, um, that that catastrophic damage amount. But uh, Bippin, it looks like you have a comment. Well, uh, what, what I think what Larry has um, articulated and Scott has followed up is that there are some real tangible values to be gained by doing research in this area, by advanced research in this area. But it's not at a but in my opinion, it's not at a point where we can leave it to the industry to fund this work because there are huge uncertainties in how the climate is going to evolve, what impact it will have, and a whole bunch of progress has to be made at, at, at multiple boundaries of disciplines. And that isn't a, the kind of research that's kept funded by uh, the bottom lines of a company, which is worried about quarter to quarter, quarter uh, the share values. So the money has to come from um, the funding agencies of certain countries could be, I, I don't think France Econ is big enough to be able to support the climate research. And, and if, uh, the, if the US agencies are not going to pick it up, perhaps the, the, the foundations of some of these large corporations may have to step up. Or otherwise, we will be delaying the progress in Syria. As, as I agree completely agree with you, Larry, that you know, uh, we are heading to a disaster. You know, if you are, if you ask, I mean, despite the uncertainties, if you sort of say, you know, you go to go to Rome and you can see structures that are 2,000 years old, and if we keep doing things the way that we are doing, are we going to be around as a humanity in 2,000 years? Forget 2,000 years. We won't be around in 500 years. We won't be around in 200 years. Right? So now, there's a lot of uncertainty of what will happen in 100 years from now. Uh, maybe we'll be in deep, deep trouble, or maybe we'll be on in relatively small trouble, which you could manage. And that's the uncertainty we have to figure out. But it's if you go just a couple of hundred years out, we are in really deep trouble. And for us to ignore that and for us to sort of uh, delay action for a couple more decades so is really responsible. No, absolutely, Vivian. Um, thank you for your comments. So just bringing this back. So from the comments that we just heard from Larry Vippen and, and Puarik, um, and may have motivated some students to maybe explore a course outside of their traditional discipline. I mean, how exactly do you do that? Uh, you know, if there's a computer scientist that says, hey, I want to work on this climate change problem, you know, is there courses that they can take to really be able to at least determine whether or not it's an area of interest for them? And on the other side, you know, if there's an earth scientist who's like, you know, I need a, a data science 101 course to, you know, look at these new methods and I have all these data sets I want to analyze, you know, are those courses really prepared for these different types of students to come in and learn the materials? Well, one of the things that um, we're seeing is, of course, the birth of things like Coursera. Uh, in fact, uh, Ilkay Altentis, who was here, uh, mm -hmm. is just fired up a new one with 25,000 students uh, in data science uh, yesterday. <laughs> uh, 
So um, I think that we don't want to just think about the university is doing this, but I, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic uh, along that line, Scott. I mean, I think with the data science initiatives, um, you know, $75 million, for instance, the private gift uh, to UCSD for data science uh, initiatives from Tenere, uh, that's a pretty sizable chunk of change. That's not going to go into a building. You know, that's got to be spent. So, I, and I, we've got a chancellor who uh, is uh, pushing very hard um, recruiting faculty to UCSD that are uh, bi departmental. So, in other words, one in engineering, one in medicine, one in SIO, you know, one in computer science or something like that. Uh, and dozens of these uh, hires. Uh, and, and that's because he's trying to change the culture. Um, so, I, you know, I think you're going to see a lot of change in the universities. And because it's so competitive, I mean, you think it's lost on on San Diego or Irvine that yesterday Berkeley announces there's a vice chancellor for data sciences at Berkeley that in fact for Jupiter which as I said I think will be the digital you know fabric in which data science is done uh, all Berkeley students undergraduates will be working over the next three years using Jupiter you know, that's change. That's radical change. So I think there's a lot of cause for optimism. And I think workshops like this that you've organized, Scott, is, is, is just what we need to get people to find each other. So as these structural changes come, you have a place, you're, you're ready to go. You're ready to fit in and take advantage of it. Other questions from the audience? Anish? Well, I think there's some very interesting work going on. I don't, I don't work in causality. It's not my area. But there's some very good people doing some really interesting work. And, and maybe four or five years ago, I would have said, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think this is possible. But th I mentioned uh, some economists, uh, Susan Athey at Stanford. There's some machine learning folks, uh, Bernard Scholkoff at Max Planck in, in Germany. Uh, so Susan, for example, and, and colleagues, they're using um, predictive models as a component of a larger causal modeling type of framework, and they found it very useful. So that's, they're kind of taking advantage of what we know in machine learning, but, but thinking causally, and, and uh, I, I think, you know, I, I don't really know, I don't want to extrapolate <laughs> where that work will go, but it, it, looks, it looks very interesting and uh, could have implications for the sciences as well. Again, the thing is, you have observational data. You're not doing a controlled experiment. What can you tell from observational data? And there, I think there has been some real progress in that. Again, there may be other people in the room that know more about this, and if they do, please pipe up and say what I'm not saying. So, so being able to understand the, the cause and effect mechanisms at the heart of scientific advances. Right? So. Um, so in any discipline, if you're in art science and oceanography or, or physical sciences and uh, aerospace engineer, you're trying to sort of uh, um, looking at the simulation data, observation data, uh, experiments, trying to figure out what the mechanisms are. And, and at, 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 at in, in many ways, if you're in hydrology, you're building a hydrological model and you're calibrating it. And, 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 the, and the question is, where does that work meets what we do in machine learning, and, and it sort of this this point comes up quite a bit in, in, in you know in many disciplines, but you know especially uh, there's been great debate in hydrology. There was a series of debate papers that were published in, in the top hydrology journals, and they were sort of talking about well we build these um, hydrological models, we have a whole bunch of parameters, and then we calibrate them using observations. So they have the observations of how much precipitation there is and how much. <coughs> the rain is showing up, how much the water flow is showing up in the gauges. 
And you use this input-output pair, so a whole bunch of them, to calibrate the, the components, the parameters of, the, of this very large complex hydrological model. Now, if you look at that process, um, you can sort of almost sort of say, well, this is what machine learners do, right? Uh, they have input and output pairs, which are the training sets, and you use them to build a model. Uh, now, the only difference is that in, if you come to this side of the machine learning, uh, we start with the input output pairs, and as Parikh sort of said, well, you know, we have a whole bunch of different families of functions we can work with, you know, logistic regression, deep learning, and, and so forth. But, but they, none of them know anything about the physics uh, that you're working on, right? And, and on the other hand, these hydrological models are built around the knowledge of, of hydrology, except that the whole bunch of places, they don't, they don't, they're not able to observe the physics, so they make they make approximations, they do parameterizations. Uh, they may be bringing in wrong physics because they don't know what it is, uh, or the physics, physical approximation isn't, isn't gonna work in, in the Irvine, but it will work in, in San Francisco or something. So, so the question is, how do you bring these together? If you keep doing things the way we do in machine learning, uh, the chances of it sort of getting you the physical insight is a lot less. There is a possibility that I may overtrain a model that will work today but may not work six months from now. Uh, and what I sort of say is what is even a lot worse is that I may think the model works, I may think the model is generalizable using the standard machinery that I have in machine learning, and then when you pick it up, you find out it's completely wrong. So if you take it up today thinking that you know, it has been calibrated uh, correctly, and when it sort of goes into the field, it, it sort of does very poorly in a very uh, uh, big example, very prominent example of the Google flu trend. You know, they sort of, they build a model, they sort of, they cross-validated, they thought it was working very well, and a couple of years later, it just became very off. So I, th I think the, the bigger danger is the reason you want to go to understanding the causal mechanics is not just because that's important. Of course, it's extremely important, right? But even more so, so that we can build models that are not going to be brittle. Or, uh, or useless or, or something laughable. I mean, for example, if you manage to distinguish between uh, the cats and, and I like for a short example of numbers, right? One, two, three, four, 99.9% 9 accuracy, but then you show some gibberish and it's, talk, it's sort of saying it's zero with 99.9% 9 .9 accuracy. Now that is completely acceptable in, in a scientific domain. So we have to be able to, uh, to, to sort of make sure we don't set, fall into the trap, which means we have to build the paradigms of machine learning that can somehow incorporate the knowledge uh, of these different disciplines. And then that's, of course, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in that direction. And you see in the physical modeling the very similar issues, right? I mean, hydrologic forecasts uh, bust all the time where you know, they overpredict uh, a certain rainfall or uh, stream flow runoff from rainfall, or, you know, they also, um, you know, show other issues that end up, um, you know, causing us to look back and say, well, what part of that physical model missed uh, picking up on this rainfall uh, event? So, in a way, it's kind of very similar. In, in and it's very similar, and actually what was very surprising to me when I was reading these, these serial debate papers in hydrology, was they, they were lamenting the, exactly what you just sort of said, that we have reached a point that our models get to get very, very complex. They're not able to reduce uncertainty to a great extent. And then they brought up the question, a concept called equifinality. And, and this is something we never talk about in, 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 in our field. You give me a training set, and I have a model one, it gives me 80% accuracy. You have a model two, we have 83% accuracy. Uh, or, uh, and if the accuracy is about the same, we think the model is the same. It doesn't really matter how different the models may be. So what they sort of said is, uh, here is a situation in which I have a hydrological model. It's, it's of course not doing a very good job of predicting the, the, the values that you want, but here are two completely inconsistent realization of the model that have a, a equal amount of uncertainty, which means what, what they sort of could tell from that situation is that these two models are both wrong, number one. Uh, number two, it, you can also sort of, but, but you knew that, you knew that uh, how much error there is, but what they sort of said is, aha, this also tells us that we don't have the sufficient amount of training data right. to be able to train the model, because I can come up with two completely different physical realizations that are inconsistent, mm -hmm. uh, and that means there's something wrong, I need more. And that is something I sort of said, we in computer science and machine learning can learn because we always talk about cross-validation errors or generalization errors, but if I'm getting two different kind of errors from completely inconsistent models, there's something wrong. But we don't have the notion of inconsistency because we only look at the errors. 
And this is where we need to bridge the gap. If you want to sort of traverse the road to causality, we need to figure out how do we sort of bring in the physical aspects of the problem into our model and sort of say, is our model generalizable and also physically consistent so that I can trust it uh, in, in the future? Okay. Other questions? How do you see our research library infrastructure evolving over the next five to ten years to deal with analysis and exploration of you know, multi petabyte size data sets and of course those interdisciplinary research across those assets respectively? Well, uh, as I mentioned, in August uh, we'll have the first uh, workshop on national research platform. How do we take what we're doing on the West Coast here, and and and, the, and it's not like how do we, that we're going to go out and build it. It's just the questions of what it, would it take to scale it, and if it were scaled, of course, it would link into all of the major data repositories and um, computational facilities in the country. Um, I think you're going to see one of the big things is is um, much more of a blending of the two completely separate worlds today of uh, machine learning, big data analysis, and high, you know, high performance computing, solving laws of physics, you know. And in fact, uh, people maybe aren't as aware of this as they should be. This country still uh, has uh, President Obama's uh, initiative to build an exascale machine as the law of the land. And, and in that, if you read it, it says that one of the requirements for this exascale machine, and that's a thousand petaflops, which is, you know, our machines these days are tens of petaflops, um, will be as good at data analytics uh, and big data as it is at solving partial differential equations. That has never been a requirement for the next generation supercomputer, and I've been through somewhere between a billion and a trillion fold increase in speed in my lifetime uh, in supercomputers. So it's, it's a fork in the road where, and in fact, there's uh, really great papers that have been written recently on, you know, you got Hadoop over here, and you got, you know, your traditional HPC stack over here, and then how are those going to come together, right? So, so a lot of the thinking architecturally about the software systems that sit across this distributed uh, data and compute fabric um, on a national basis are, are, are going to be brought together. And actually, you know, this happened before in industry. You take like car crashes. As that went from, you know, one-dimensional to two-dimensional to three-dimensional to then three-dimensional multi-scale, when it got to that level or designing, say, a, you know, the latest 777 or 787 aircraft where you're down to the rivets, you know. <laughs> um, you have to have a vast database to define the object that you're then computing on, right? So you're, you're having the data coming together, just data, <laughs> with the solutions of the laws of physics. So I really think we're going to, this is going to be a golden decade uh, ahead of us for the blending of those things together and and, and I'm seeing much more discussion about that in this issue of what would be a national cyber infrastructure. Um, it's going to be, I mean, it, it's, it's going to be a huge problem to solve, but that means there's all these great problems to work on <laughs> about how you would solve it. So I think it's very positive that way. All right, question back. You know. Well, remember that graduate studies include both masters and PhD, and uh, we've seen a huge increase in the masters program, and not just MS but MAS, uh, Applied Science, uh, at universities in the last decade. 
Um, and, and if you're in a master's program, you have to have a problem <laughs> to work on, a terminal problem, right? And so um, I think that's a huge opportunity for taking the first steps at uh, blending uh, these worlds we've been spending three days talking about uh, into an individual. Um, and and um, I, I, it gets away from the tyranny of the reductionist departments uh, and what they want their PhDs, you know, to be pure and reproduce their, profess their professor's field or something like that, um, which is a big driver of this whole world. But the master's program, I think, may provide a much larger flexibility space. Um, and so that's where I'm uh, trying to put a lot of my energy here. And, and I think yeah, you're seeing that across uh, other universities as well. I'll, I'll just speak for machine learning. Uh, probably most of our best students don't come in just from computer science. They have some kind of interdisciplinary background as an undergraduate, or maybe they're from physics or something. So that seems to work really well in our field. Um, so I think our data science students, for example, would be very well positioned to go and do machine learning in, in grad school. Also, I think some more forward-thinking stats departments will want them to. Um, so I, I think maybe industry might, ex certain industries might want people with very well-defined backgrounds. But uh, in, in grad school, you kind of are looking for students that are thinking outside the box and doing something a bit more uh, challenging than in, in their undergraduate setting. Great. about five minutes so this will be the last question and right um, scientists by and large are not the best people at explaining things to lay people uh, one of the things I've profited from over the years is working directly with a journalist uh, to understand how to <laughs> use a different language uh, to and maybe different values actually to convey new results in a way that they excite the public and get support. There are training courses uh, for, for scientists, for instance, uh, to learn how to do that. But just because you're smart doesn't mean you know how to explain things to people. Um, and unfortunately, in undergrad and grad school, you get zero training in our universities. I think that's a real deficit. Um, it's just not right. I mean, you know, fundamentally, you're going to spend the rest of your life writing papers and giving talks, whether it's teaching courses or whatever. Uh, or if you're in industry, you're going to write reports. <laughs> and, uh, and so we ought to have a lot more uh, training like that. For instance, here, we have now for 17 years a summer program. And in fact, it's at both campuses, both at Irvine. For Cal IT2, we have two campuses. Uh, for undergraduates, and uh, they come from all different disciplines, and it's to work in a field of research, and you and and they cross train each other, so so they'll they'll have a session like I've been in sessions here where they will all make a poster, and then they'll come each of them will come and and sort of in a constructive way criticize the way that they set the poster up, and they you know I can't understand this, you didn't make this clear, and so forth. That's incredibly powerful. Uh, they do the same with, you have to give a PowerPoint talk, right? <laughs> and then they say, boy, you're using font that's way too small, you know. <laughs> There's all these little things that make difference between exciting people and putting them to sleep uh, or turning them off, which is even worse. I think I'll just add to that, uh, that this being able to communicate uh, to the general public is so much more important now for the kind of discipline you're working in, especially in light of what happened yesterday. So we better act up. We better figure out how, how do we convince the rest of the public as to what we're doing something really serious. Great. All right. Well, let's uh, thank our panel. So I took quite a few notes uh, from that, and I look forward to kind of going through them. Um, this will um, be the end of the, the workshop. 
uh, over the next couple months, we'll be putting together kind of a synthesis report. And if you're interested in uh, uh, helping to work on that, please come uh, reach out to me. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the speakers and, and the support from the Pacific Research Platform, uh, the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes, and the Scripps Institution of Oceanography for helping to really uh, make this event so great. So um, thank you all, and thank you to the volunteers and the chairs of the session. So uh, have a great weekend, everybody, and uh, that'll do it for the workshop. And thank you, Scott, for organizing this. Yes. Uh, thank you.